Hi, this is Kayoko Mitsumatsu. I'm the founder of Yoga Gives Back. And you're listening to Awakened Nation with Brad Solos. So, Zlo, sorry. <laughs> you could say <laughs> Zalas. <laughs> A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up. Tired of the way things used to be, they are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zalas, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers, the disruptors, and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Welcome to Awakened Nation. Hi, everyone. This is Brad Zalas. On today's episode of Awakened Nation, I have two extraordinary guests. First up is Kayoko Mitsumatsu, the founder of Yoga Gives Back. My second guest is Belinda Carlisle, the lead singer of the Go-Go's, who co-founded the Animal People Alliance. The reason I had them on today is Belinda is receiving the Namaste Award from Yoga Gives Back for the extraordinary work the Animal People Alliance is doing in India and Thailand. First up is my interview with Kayoko. She shares the extreme poverty that the women of India live through on a day-to-day -day basis and her mission to change this along with how yoga inspired her to give back to life. Take a moment to sit back and relax and listen to these two extraordinary women here on Awakened Nation. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a great guest on today, the founder and president of Yoga Gives Back, Kayoko Mitsumatsu. Uh, she started the organization to empower underserved women and children in India. And she says it best. I love this in her bio. She says, yoga has given me so much, a way to find peace in my heart. Most importantly, faith in myself. I am eternally grateful. And I know millions of people in the world share the same gratitude. Please welcome to Awakened Nation, Kayoko. Thank you so much for having me, Brad. Uh, really nice to meet you. Same here. I want to go back to the beginning because you were a yoga practitioner for quite some time in California, I believe. Yeah. Um, and um, something awakened in you and you wanted to start this movement. Let's let's begin there. Yeah, good question. Yeah, thank you. So I started practicing yoga about 17 years ago, around 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker as a profession, which I'd been doing uh, by then over 25 years. Uh, I'm from Japan originally, and I was a documentary filmmaker for Japanese National Public Television for NHK for that long. And I was doing a documentary about, about microfinancing. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Yunus, uh, who just became the interim leader for the country of Bangladesh, um, he just received Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for his revolutionary microfinancing, which most of you probably know, but if you give um, probably like $10, $15 for the poorest person in the developing countries as a loan, they can start their own income earning businesses and get out of poverty. That's the microfinancing. So mm -hmm. in 2006, I was paying about $15 per yoga class and I was benefiting so much from the practice. And I realized, wait a minute, India, where yoga is from, there is so much poverty there. At that time, um, the statistics said 75% of the population was still living under $2.5 a day poverty line. Wow. Mm -hmm. So wait a minute, we are spending $15 per yoga class and drinking smoothies and stuff like that afterwards and feeling great and healthy. So we need to do something to give back and make the playing field a little bit more fair. I like this. You know, when I saw the microloan uh, initiatives, I was blown away because you could see how this was benefiting uh, women, disenfranchised women in countries that are in Africa and also in India and other parts of the world where $15 can change a life. So uh, this impact is, is phenomenal. So what happened? Did you, did you fly to India to meet these women and just get involved? Just, just <laughs> threw yourself in as they say. 
Yeah, well, India is such a huge country, and I had never yeah. been at that time, so I had no idea how to start this. I never even started, you know, worked for a nonprofit or um, run nonprofit organization. So I just started talking about this idea of how to, like, first uh, create a community and fundraise through yoga classes to raise money, right? And then I learned about Grameen Foundation, which is Dr. Yunus's uh, global like wing based in Washington, D.C. So I reached out to them and said, can we raise money for women in India? And can you send this money <laughs> to India? So yeah. some people that you guys know through Grammy Foundation can benefit as a micro loan funding. And they said, yes, it took a while for a while, but it was a kind of very um, niche and also very unique uh, opportunity for you, Grammy Foundation, to help yoga community to get involved in the microfinancing movement. So we started that way. And then I was introduced to an um, organization in, in India whom microfinancing program in Grameen Foundation supports. So that's the beginning of my trip in 2007. And that's how I started meeting all these women whose lives have been, like you, you're mentioning, have been totally transformed with as small as $15 a month. Right. Well, I watched some of the uh, videos that you had on on your website. Thank you. And and you were you were also getting involved in educating these women and showing them how business works. But also, you know, I, I saw you were talking about personal hygiene, and also they had uh, machinery shipped in so that they could start making money in, in, in these places where uh, poverty is just it's everywhere uh let's talk about that a little bit because what shocked you the most when you went to india and you you were up close to this you saw it in real time you weren't just watching it on a video screen like most people you were there you were involved yes um that's a really good point i um and thanks for watching my ygb films sure. that i pr continue to produce in india um I lived in Brazil when I was younger, so I had witnessed a poverty and the wealth in a very contrast way. And India, I felt pre pretty similar. Whenever you your car stops, uh, kids come to your car to beg money. Woman with a you know baby who has obviously has nothing begging money. It's very difficult to deal with. So um, I, of course, I can't start anything from scratch in India. So I worked with, I luckily I was introduced to two non-government organizations, NGOs in India. And we started sending money through, uh, we created the program with them, which we've been working since then, like two, like now 15 years now. Um, so you know, our, my goal always has been that we don't come with idea and push them because we don't know the real reality, right? The poverty right. is so serious, but social impact and everything is so serious. And a lot of delicate, de delicate things we don't know. So um, we work very closely with NGO partners and develop programs together. And then that's how we learn the real needs in the ground, on the ground. And they monitor the programs. So we continue to fundraise here through yoga communities. Now we reached out to 30 communities in the world, 30 countries in the world. Um, wow. Yeah, so that's how we've been doing this. I, I have to let everybody know, uh, you're, you have this growing global support, and you talked about this. You're now empowering over 2,400 women and children in India with a minimum five-year commitment to each person. I love this. Uh, today, Yoga Gives Back's Sister Aid program provides microloans to 550 mothers and primary education to 600 young girls and abandoned children. Our SHE, Scholarship for Higher Education, or SHE, programs offers 400 disadvantaged youths in Karnataka and West Bengal an opportunity to obtain college degrees. This, and you're on your 17th year, am I correct, in, with Yoga Gives Back? Yes. This is very exciting, very exciting. Uh, I want to talk about, you know, yoga inspired you so much to create this organization. What was it about yoga that just changed your life? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, uh, because I'm sure a lot of listeners practice some kind of yoga these days. 300 million people in the world are enjoying this practice either. Yes. Are you do too? 
I do a little bit, uh, you know, the warrior's pose. I do the downward dog, upward dog, and it actually helps with my shoulders. You know, thanks. Yeah. I'm a martial artist. So, um, oh. you know, stretching is incredibly important, especially as we get older. Uh, you know, I'm a, I've entered that, that period in my life where I'm in my sixties. So stretching is incredibly important for me, how we eat, how we do things and meditation as well. So, Yeah. Uh, everybody does it nowadays in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, I'm glad you share that, Brad. Um, I can see your Kenpo Jujutsu certificate behind you, so you're a serious uh, martial yes. artist. Yes, um, mm. I actually practiced Taekwondo for a long time, too. But nice. anyway, yeah, so when you do yoga, like you said, you stretch your body, you learn how to breathe slowly. Um, and that's, that has a really significant impact within you not just physical, but really mental impact. I think that's how a lot of people get hooked. Um, so I started as a physical practice, but eventually um, I started learning about uh, philosophy of yoga and realized asana, which is a physical practice, is just a very small part of big tradition of yoga. The real yeah. goal of yoga is to find yourself being able to meditate for a long time, which will also connect you small self to your bigger self that i didn't know that existed but right. everybody knows that you have an inner calling of good things to do you know hopeful things to do for the future or for the world and um that's what i really i was 47 at that time and i also learned that the first part of your life is to learn and experience. But second part of your life, you are supposed to use that accumulation of knowledge and experience for the benefit of others um, and for the society. And it really hit me hard. I was working so hard as a documentary producer doing all sorts of current affairs, stories of minorities and trying to do good for the society, bring out the stories, the voices of the voiceless. But at the end of the day, I was just doing for the broadcasting program yeah. eight but in a call call within me that yoga and meditation has really made clear was that i was looking for something that i can really do for my for my life as my life mission and i realized uh giving back to the source of yoga which has given me and made my mission for life so clear, crystal clear uh i needed to give back with all my efforts, all my energy um, to support, especially underserved women and children who have no even luxury of doing stretch and meditation every day. They're busy making just ends meet, right? Um, I don't think Americans, and, I, and I'm not calling us out, Americans and Europeans, really understand poverty. Uh, mm. There are places in this world where people can't afford clothing. You know, they they go walk to work you know, they don't have a job they walk naked in the streets and they'll go to a a sugarcane plantation and beg to work for the day just to get stew at the end of the day now yeah. this is the kind of poverty you know in america poverty to us is you, you know you can't afford rent or but you have three televisions in your house you know it's like that, that's poverty to an american we're talking about people who day-to-day -day survival is dependent on whether they they get a little money or meet somebody who's generous or you know this is depressing level poverty where you don't have hope and you coming in is a breath of sunshine um i believe and it, it's changing lives um uh, so i i really bless god bless you i mean you i take my hat off to the work you're doing um and you said something that I, I believe in as well, and it's, it makes me laugh because I think along the same lines. And that is the ancient Greeks believed that you should get an apprenticeship, you should learn, 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 learn as much as you can. And then when you hit around your 30s or 40s, you should now become a master teacher. And we do that in the martial arts as well. And I, I truly believe that it's time to give back. It's time to show and, and, and kind of give the next generation that, that standard that they can live by. And it's all through you showing up. So thank you. Thank you for your work. Well, thank you for sharing the same feeling. Um, now, I want to talk about you guys created this great award called the Namaste Award. <laughs> 
And I want to talk about how did that get started? Was that, you know, just, hey, we got to find somebody who's totally awesome. Uh, <laughs> that's for the young people out there. I don't know how they, they speak nowadays, but um, this is an award that, that you take very seriously. And it's for people who really are giving back in society. So how did that get started? Yes. So as you can see, if you go to our website, yogagiftsback.org, you always see these hands, uh, praying hands, uh, saying namaste. So namaste means um, the divinity in you supports or salutes divinity in me, salutes divinity in you. So really recognizing the divinity in both ourselves and in others. That's how we are also connected. Um, so in that spirit, we've been doing this program with Yoga Gives Back, helping women and children. And we started doing a gala, annual gala, to do more fundraising. Um, and I, then we started thinking to get more publicity, really, to and get to get more fundraising um, going. We need some kind of little bit of celebrity, you know, thing going in the organization. So it, it was like altruistic kind of uh, motive that was behind it. But, you know, our volunteers, young young uh, members told me about yeah. this idea and I get, okay, so let's do something. So we did, we but we didn't want to just give awards just because they're famous. So they're, they, you know, and also booking celebrities is very difficult anyways. We didn't yeah. want, we didn't have money and time for that. So we realized, but if you look around, there are some individuals, you know, famous people who do really good work and who yeah. have been very known in the yoga community because of either their yoga practice, meditation, or their music, or their, you know, active activism that right. probably usually don't associate them with. But when you look back, you do research more, there are some individuals. So, so for example, David Lynch, who is a huge medita meditator and really believes in meditation, will create peace. Alanis Morissette was one of our uh, recipients also, who is a very spiritual person, takes you know her spiritual activism very seriously. And this year we are giving to uh, Belinda Carlisle, who is, of course, famous as a Gogo's vocal, vocalist, but he she has co-founded Animal People Alliance. She's a hugely dedicated animal rights activist. So we want to bring in these people and shed light upon their humanitarian activism beyond their status as a celebrity and sh celebrate that with us. So that's our well, Namaste Award. And we also... I love that you've you yeah. you don't just pick somebody who's famous. They have to be doing something. Yes. And uh you just mentioned, and we're gonna have her on the show as well. Uh Belinda Carlisle is this year's recipient with her work with the Animal People Alliance. And uh I love the fact, you know, David Lynch, I've heard that he's a big fan of uh meditation. And this is um, there is what's called light and sound yoga, which is the meditative, pure meditative practice of yoga, but there's all different levels of yoga to awaken and open you. And, um, I'm going to talk uh, later on with Belinda about, um, Kundalini yoga and the awakening and the rebirth, which I find fascinating as well. Uh, but, uh, Getting back to what made you choose Belinda this year? And I know I know you just touched on it, but how did her work capture your attention? Yes. So actually during pandemic, so we were doing this fundraising every year in person. We suddenly couldn't do this anymore, right? Yes. So I had to switch to online gala and it was all new to us. We had to we didn't know what to do with the online event. So Donna Delori is the um the famous backup number one backup singer for Madonna, oh, wow. uh, 20 years. So if you look at Madonna's uh, any videos, Donna is right there behind her always. Anyways, she also started spiritual healing music for the last two decades. And out of blue, when we were uh, thinking about this online gala, Donna Delori came to me and said, Kayoko, I actually just uh, recorded a beautiful music, mantra music called Satsiri with Belinda Carlisle, and we want to donate it for you. And I was blown away. It was a beautifully produced music video that we keep using. And 
that really helped us to promote our online first online gala and people were blown away. And ever since then we met with Belinda. That's how I got connected to Belinda and learned about also more about her work with Animal yeah. People Alliance and so on. And she joined us online during the pandemic with Zoom events, talk about the power of mantra, power of sound. So I learned more and more about her. And she's just amazing, fantastic human being. You will really enjoy talking to her. Good. I find that people who've been through hell and back, um, you know, been through rough times and recovered, I find that they really have this tenderness in their heart about being kind, being loving. Um, and they, you know, sorry to use a Western term, but uh, no BS zones. They, they really talk the talk and walk the walk. And I love the fact that you chose her because she has been through so much. And uh, I'm going to talk to her a little bit. She's going to be on after you. And we're going to be talking a little bit about her Kundalini awakening, her rebirth. So that's that's very powerful. Yoga changed her life as well, the, the practice of yoga. So phenomenal. Um, let me ask you uh, this question, because as a documentary filmmaker, what else have you seen that has um, maybe taken your breath away or made you go, wow, you know, you've had a, an, an amazing transformational uh, scene behind the camera that you were able to capture? Yes, thank you. Um, so I've been taking my camera, a little camera, <laughs> since my first trip to India in 2007, my friend editor told me like, Kayoko, you never know what's going to happen. Just take your camera with you. I, I've i never filmed by myself because I was yeah. always, you know, lucky to have a cameraman and all the crew with me. But suddenly I'm a grassroots leader, no budget. So I started carrying my yeah. camera. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. Exactly. I came back with the footage and my friend editor is like, Kayoko, what are you doing? Where is the B-roll? And I go, what are you talking about B-roll? You know, I'm talking to people for the first time. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, I learned long... Uh, you know, this way, but many stories. But first thing I learned um, that kind of really hit me hard was, so first I went to India and I started meeting these women who received microloans. All the mothers that I met told me they were happy that they're getting loans, but they were all saying, I don't want my children to live like me, which is a very sad comment. But I guess that's how generations change in yeah. up course. So anyways, um, either it's a son or daughter, they wanted their children to have good education, which they never had. They ended up living like a domestic servants, most of them, no respect yeah. in at, at home or at, in the community. So they don't want children to live like that miserable life. I was shocked and I realized, that's when I realized, oh my God, it's one thing to give uh, financial tools for these women to get out of poverty, but we really need to look after next generation with educational opportunities yeah. because the income from microloans was still too small to send kids to like medical school and so on. So we started the program Scholarship for Higher Education, which has become like phenomenal program. We have hundreds of people graduating now with college degrees and wow. they're becoming like real change makers. And um, the impact of this program, scholarship program, is not just academics degrees, but more importantly, these people, these young people have such great um, dedication to give back to community and families. So they never say, I want to buy a house with a swimming pool. I want to buy a Porsche or anything like that. I never heard anything like that, that with from hundreds yeah. of hundreds of young people. They all say, I want to help my parents. If they have parents, I want to build school, hospital, library wow. in the community because we don't have any. I want to build bridge. You know, they they think and they they're doing this. And the biggest thing, I, I'm sorry, I can't stop talking when I start talking about this. But there are girls now who want to become lawyers, policemen. Do you know why? Because there have never been people legally or enforcement area who helped their mothers or them when they were attacked sexually, for example. So they want to really take power into mm -hmm. their hands to be able to bring in more like justice into the society and safe place um, in the society. So this is a change. 
this is blowing my mind because those of you who are listening, I want you to understand how things may be in other countries. And I've had experience with this. You may have generation after generation that is not educated. They are living in poverty and they are invited into a person's house, the whole family. And this other family may have some wealth and they enter into servitude. They, you know, they do their laundry. They do, they do the cooking. They do all these things. They don't get paid and they don't go to school or college or anything. So the next generation is forced to go into this type of servitude. And this happens all over the world. It happens in India. It happens in Haiti. It happens, you know, wherever there's this disparity between um, the socioeconomic disparity between one generation and another. Um, and so you're breaking those cycles which God bless you for doing. And uh, by the way, some of these cycles go back thousands of years. <laughs> We're not talking a few hundred, We're talking thousands of years. And in countries like India, a person's last name designates where they are in the caste system. So sometimes a person can't even imagine getting out of their role in life, uh, being an indentured servant or just having being forced to be a servant simply because you have no other options and you are giving them choices in this world. I just, I mean, I don't even know what to say at this point beyond thank you. God bless, you know, namaste, <laughs> as you would say, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm almost to the point of tears because sometimes even I can get into the Western mindset where it's like, yeah, I want a nice car and I want to, and then you hear that these kids, they want to grow up and build a bridge. They want to grow up and, and help their mom and dad. You, you know, we're, we're so, how can I say it? Topsy turvy here in the Western world. Sometimes I'm kind of like, you know, that seems so logical, 100% logical that you would give back to your mom, but sometimes it escapes us here. Would you say that's true? Yes. And also there are two things. One is life is hard in America too, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, yeah. so I, what I ask is just do whatever you want, you know, just if you, but if you can practice yoga, that means you have a little bit of extra time, extra money, most of the time. So even a dollar a day can change child's life. Yeah. And secondly, most important for me is after doing this 17 years, I have to really share this. It's not just our giving money to them, but they're giving back to us so much so this eternal circulation of gratitude is happening. I think that's the real power. It's more than monetary. The people in India really, of course, appreciate our funding that is life-changing, but seeing, witnessing their gratitude and their commitment to make their countries better place yeah. really inspire us because it's so selfless. So it teaches us so much. So we do more. So this is like going around and around. I love that. It's uh, you're breaking generational cycles, and uh, I love that it's changing mindset, things like that. I have a very powerful question for you, uh, and most of my guests get this this uh, question, and it takes a minute to answer. But of all the work you've been doing, all the things that have happened in your life, all of your commitment to this, what has been your greatest memory or your favorite memory? Yeah, I do. I have a minute to think, or twenty minutes to think. <laughs> you have know. as long as you want to take. This is your show, not mine. I just show up and ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, you know, obviously, I, I filmed so many stories over thirty years that was profound. But I think Guru Prasad, Guru Prasad, filming Guru, Guru Prasad, who is the the son of a Michael Long woman whom I met when he was 15, couldn't speak a word of English. Um, and then her mom just got Michael on. That's how I met the family in, outside of Bangalore in India. And uh, he really wanted to become a doctor and help the family and the community because there was no hospital in there. But he couldn't speak this in English, so I was always getting translation. But I could also see that was her, his mother's dream. His mother wanted him to become a doctor. Long story short, we 
I continued to go back to India, continued. I was thinking to film his mom first, you know, as a micro loan recipient. But then I started to realize this kid's dedication to study is something else. He just, every year I go, he just said, I want to become a doctor. I want to become a doctor. So we ended up funding his whole school, uh, you know, education, medical school. And then uh, he became a doctor now. But anyways, one time I was filming him and he said this to me. Kayoko, this is after she became a doctor. So maybe three years ago or four years ago, before pandemic, he said, Kayoko, you, yoga kicks back is the water. I am the seed. You water the seed. Now this seed is grown to be a tree so that this tree can give shelter for thousands of people. That's what he said. He he gave me so many quotes that moved me so much over the years, but I was just like, really that he described, as you can see, like in a visual, more spiritual, fundamental way, what we do and what impact we can create. And that was so moving. By the wow. way, that's, that's the film now. It's called From Seedling to Sheltering Tree. We're going to take a moment to show the work that Kayoko is doing over in India. And we're going to start with the young man who became a doctor. Uh, ready? Ready, everybody? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, roll the tape. For over 14 years, Yoga Gives Back has provided scholarships to hundreds of disadvantaged youths in India. I was a seed you gave all the nourishment, nurtured me and you have made me a big tree today. So uh, the tree which can give a shelter to thousands of people. So if you are not there, I would have not been in this position to serve the people. Yoga Gives Back has documented Guru Prasad's journey since 2007, when his mother received her first micro loan for 7,000 rupees, the equivalent of 120 US dollars. This small micro loan made a huge impact on Jaya Shree's family life. It funded her husband's auto rickshaw business and tripled their income. In one year, Jaya Shree was able to pay back this entire loan and became eligible for her second loan. With that loan, she was able to buy a sewing machine. The boost in the family's ability to bring in more money allowed Guru Prasad to pursue higher education opportunities instead of having to work. Now we are some great. Om Shri. Tumba chana idhar tarar sir. Nan nan nodi noke nan kintha kelgadai ro tumba chana idhar sir. Or get facilities sick the or get awareness go till the other go till the or a lot of other so or awareness create more because none can the category of your name made it to cover the corner as a son we should start in the initial stage so so whenever it is going for a for the stages, I will go to that extent. Now, like it has been followed from our ancestors, generation, generation. We call it as Vasudaiva Kutumbakam. The meaning of Vasudaiva Kutumbakam means we see every people as belongs to us. Whether they are of different locality, different language, different country. We don't see them as other people, other race people. Under. We see everyone are our family. If I can say what Yoga Gives Back organization has done, uh, in my life, when I when I was in 15, I met uh, Kayoko Ma, and yoga gives back. I was a seed at that time, so you are the one who poured a water, who has been a sunlight, and who has nurtured a small seed to this tree today. 
So this tree is now is able to give shelter to thousands of people. So it's all because of you people. In 2021, while the COVID-19 crisis engulfed India, Dr. Guru Prasad was volunteering at a medical facility and treated and over 50 and COVID patients a day. The coronavirus crisis is continuing to on India's government to impose a national lockdown after the country recorded more than 20 million COVID infections. The Times of India reported a rare case of a newborn baby with COVID complications in May of that year. Dr. Guru Prasad was quoted as saying, this is the youngest patient we came across who needs oxygen. She will get the support she needs. This baby girl fully recovered from COVID-19 and was discharged in October of 2021. Today, Yoga Gives Back supports 400 youths with a five-year SHE scholarship for higher education in Karnataka and West Bengal, India. I don't know what to say. You've blown my mind. Ladies and gentlemen, Kayoko, yeah. Mitsumatsu, and please reach out and donate to Yoga Gives Back. Go to their website, yogagivesback.org. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for being on Awakened Nation, uh, Kyoko. Thank you. What a fascinating story, fascinating stuff. You truly are giving back, and I truly have to say namaste to you. Thank you. I must say, thank you so much, Brad. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. okay. I gotta get. I gotta start doing more yoga. So thank <laughs> you. I appreciate it. Thanks so All much. Right. Bye. Have a you good bet. day. Bye. You too. Bye bye. Isn't Kayoko amazing? The work she's doing in India is an inspiration, and I had a lot of fun interviewing her. Up next is the second half of this interview, and that's with the Namaste Award winner for 2024, Belinda Carlisle. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a great guest on today. I know some of you have been waiting to hear from her, uh, but I have the legendary Belinda Carlisle from the Go-Go's, <laughs> and uh, we're here to talk about her growth. Uh, she's getting an award this year with uh, the Namaste Award from Yoga Gives Back, and uh, I just want to say, Belinda, welcome to Awakened Nation. Uh, thank you for having me. You bet. <laughs> So um, uh, I'm, I'm going to do a side note real quick. In 2021, the Go-Go's uh, were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. How did that feel? Well, I mean, I never was one to really care that much about awards and accolades and all that, you know. But I have to say that that was really exciting. And it probably was one of the highlights of my life, you know, in my career for sure. Um it was bizarre and surreal performing in front of people like Paul McCartney and Jay-Z and, you know, I mean, it was just like, it was, it was surreal and yeah. it was just a wonderful evening. Yeah. Well, you guys earned it. Um, you know, I, I saw some documentaries on what you went through. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm excited. I take my hat off. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to dig right into the interview because yoga changed your life. And I want to talk about the Kundalini rebirthing that you went through. Could you explain a little bit what happened and what you had to go through? Uh, it was very right. profound. Right. Well, you know, I mean, I've been doing Kundalini yoga for about 30 years. So, you know, um, and it's powerful. And and I knew it was powerful. I liked it because it was, I like the songs. I like the mantra. Right. Um, it was... This is about probably about 15 years ago. I was in India. I was um, with my first Kundalini teacher, Gurmukh Khalsa. And there was a, there's a yoga festival every year uh, in Rishikesh, India. And I was in, they had the classes right on the Ganga. I was in a very, it was a Kundalini class with Gurmukh teaching. It was about 200 people. Wow. And a rebirth, I've never been to a rebirthing class. And this is going to, it was going to sound bizarre to a lot of people because it's really hard to put in, into words. But, um, you know, they have uh, sometimes with with rebirthing classes, they have minders to take care of people because some people flip out, basically. Yeah. You know, so yeah. 
you know, it was like 200 of us and I was hearing screaming and yelling. I was like rolling my eyes going, oh, please, you know, just keep it to yourself. And that, that was yeah. what I was thinking. Right. And then it started happening to me. And um, I was like, it was the most bizarre sort of takeover of, I don't know what it was, but I got incredibly angry. And, um, you know, it was, it was like towards the end of the yoga festival, I was staying in the ashram there. And I had to leave class. I ran back incredibly angry, like, like sobbing. I didn't know what I was angry about, but it was like some kind of anger release. I started thinking about my mother. My mother had me when she was 17 back in the fifties. And that was kind of, must've been a heavy duty experience for her. So what I kind of, the conclusion I kind of came to was maybe that I had been absorbing whatever she was going through. I don't know what it was. So I hid in my room with the blankets over my head for like three days because I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't, I couldn't interact with anybody. Mm -hmm. I felt like I, I was like having some kind of breakdown. And then I just like packed my bags after three days, went to this fancy hotel on, on the hill, like overlooking Rishikesh on my own. And I called the doctor and he said, um, there's nothing wrong with you, um, but I'll give you some, you know, here's some salts to, to drink, you know, electrolytes to drink to, um, you know, you're a bit maybe a bit dehydrated and that's all. So I knew he was wrong. I went to sleep. I woke up and I was giddy, like mentally ill, happy for no reason. I couldn't figure that out. That was like <laughs> going from one extreme to the other. And my body, I was like, physically, I was un unable to move. I was like, I couldn't move. So yeah. I just, I waited it out. It took a couple of days to get, get through that. I didn't know what it was. I knew it was something profound. So I talked to Gurmukh about it because I was kind of, it was like sort of early on in my real um, sort of heavy duty practice of chanting and Kundalini. And she's, I said, I feel like I can't relate to anyone. And I feel like I'm sort of dangling between two worlds, between my world and like the spiritual world. What, can, what am I going to do? It's so uncomfortable. And she goes, well, there's nothing you can do. Just keep on going. <laughs> That's what she said. And I don't, and, 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 and. That's what I did. You know, it was, I look back on that and that was real, real proof to me. Um, it definitely changed me. I can't really put into words how um, it's impossible, but it definitely altered, um, altered me. And, and I don't know, I don't know how to put it, but I knew that it was real. That was like proof that it was real. And I just kept on with my practice and, you know, and, and I have a daily practice. Um, yeah. I'm on a three-year meditation now. I'm a year and a half into it. Um, I can't imagine my life without, without um, this sort of spiritual base to live my life from. Wow. That's powerful what you talked about. Um, I did ayahuasca in the desert. That's the only thing I could compare it to. <laughs> um, and I just, it, it definitely felt like a rebirth and you, you really yeah. can't put it into words. So yeah. that's yeah. awesome that you went for it. You're, you're a true warrior on this path. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it was like, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, it was proof in the pudding that, it, that it's, you know, I believe in the unseen and, 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 um, that was just proof to me that, yeah. You know, there's a lot of things out there that we'll never understand. I agree. I agree yeah. with you wholeheartedly. Um, the other thing, you know, you're receiving the Namaste Award this year from Yoga Gives Back uh, for your work as the co-founder of the Animal People Alliance, also known as the APA. And they help stray animals in India and Thailand. How did you get involved with co-founding this organization? Because this is a, a very powerful organization that solves a, a big problem with love and tenderness and, and health care. Right. right. Well, Back in 2014, I've spent a lot of time in India over the years. I have a lot of friends that work in the uh, traffic trafficking sector uh, uh -huh. for a lot of NGOs in Calcutta. So I was living in Bangkok and a bunch of friends came over from Calcutta. They're all Westerners. And one of them said, an American guy named Paul Suit said, I want to do, I want to like create some sort of animal services. And I said, I'm there. 
So it kind of evolved. I mean, APA is like a twofold mission where uh, we treat street animals, street dogs. We do a lot of house calls now, uh, mostly on-site treatment, although we do have an ambulance and a, and a operating theater now. But mm -hmm. besides treating the animals, um, and then in Thailand, it's more about adoption, spaying and neutering. And it, we work with vulnerable people, people in India who are lower caste, the caste system is alive and well there, Yes, that can't, that can't get, get employment or that have handicaps or women that have been trafficked. And we train them for employment. So they're, that's our team. In Thailand, we work a lot with hill tribes and stateless people who have no identification and and um, they're able to have work and to feed their families. So um, it's been really successful. It sort of found its way. We didn't know what it was going to be in the beginning. And, you know, like anybody who's been to India knows that day to day, you just have to go with it because you never yeah. know where the day is going, going to take you. So that was kind of our attitude with APA. We were voted the um, the top animal NGO for the past three years in the state of Bengal. Thailand uh, is, is, it's a whole different thing, but it's very well respected and and uh, everybody knows about us. And they, they have these rabies drives that, um, where everybody brings their animals and the spaying and neuter. We work with the World Veterinary Service and it's really, it's been very Im Im impactful. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to show your sizzle reel or your promotional video from the website. Okay. Uh, here we go. The Animal People Alliance and roll the tape. Hello, my name's Steve Daniel from Virgin Radio here in London, and I was recently given the opportunity to travel to Thailand to look at the work being done by Animal People Alliance up in the northern city of Chiang Rai. Now, for those of you who don't know, Animal People Alliance is an animal welfare charity. We operate in both India and in Thailand. From our base in Kolkata, the Indian operation is focused on street treatments as the pure scale of the street animal problem necessitates this approach. Literally, in Kolkata alone, there are estimated to be over 100,000 animals that literally just roam free. In Thailand, APA are tackling the issue of stray animals through sterilization programs and also operate a shelter for the rescue and rehabilitation of unwanted and mistreated animals. On arrival, we got to hang out with the many rescue animals and also spoke with some of the people, some of the wonderful people that have helped to build this sanctuary up in Northern Thailand. <laughs> how, how many dogs are here? How many dogs have we now, got here right now? 17, 17. 17 dogs. Let's go, let's go up and meet some of them. Now, tell me about Dave. I don't know yeah. if I'm allowed to have favorites, yeah. but Dave is, yeah. uh, look I at Dave's that. face. We look at that. have some people live Leave, leave him at the livestock office no. and uh, we will follow him have some accident with the leg. So he's had a leg uh, amputated, leg. isn't and he? We have, and we take and we took him to the to the clinic and uh, the, the, the bone is broke. Right. Broke and cannot connect. He must have been in a lot of pain. <laughs> yes, he must have been. Yes, but yes. look at him, he's so now. Healthy and happy. and happy. And he also eats the other dog's food, which I noticed uh, earlier. Or we, we, call, we, everyone call Cobra, right? Hello. But, but she from the, the, the trash area. Right. From the, another district, Tung district. She looks very scared. What's happened to her? Uh, I think maybe have someone abuse him, hit, hit, hit her. Yeah. And... Uh, not feed her because his body is very thin and also she has problem with the bone on on hip and very very bad very bad skin yeah and we take long time to to treat her she she very afraid us and uh, just hiding at the corner she looks sad doesn't she very very sad and now happier yeah happier although but dave keeps eating her food and, but still scare people yeah that's it. <laughs> so 
So this is the ambulance you were mm -hmm. telling me about, the Animal People Alliance ambulance uh -huh. and the money that we've raised and the benefits and the people have donated mm -hmm. have paid for this. Mm -hmm. This is the Animal People Alliance ambulance. How long have you had this for? Uh, we get uh, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks Amazing. ago. Amazing. Uh, we already used for take the kids. The cases. Uh, two cases. Two cases. So we, we use already for, for support people in the village. Uh -huh. I think it's very useful for, for help people. We don't don't need to wait because we don't have which to, to mm -hmm. support them. So we can go finally. And you can treat animals in here. Yeah. We order some cats over here mm -hmm. and for more safe for the animal. But we're waiting because they're building not they're not, not finished yet. Mm -hmm. But we will get Soon, soon. Both cats and dogs get significant time to roam free each day and playtime here can be an absolute blast, I've witnessed it. Their exercise periods undoubtedly help to de-stress the animals and are a large reason why they are so happy. If you'd like to learn more about the work Animal People Alliance do, you can visit our website at animalpeoplealliance.net and also check out our Instagram and YouTube for videos on the very latest cases. There's also an opportunity to visit this shelter and the charming town of Chiang Rai through APA's immersion programs that operate twice a year. Now here you will get to experience the many wonderful aspects of Thai culture whilst working with our team to care for cats and dogs at our shelter. Our trips fill up fast so please visit the website for full details, be quick and we can't wait to welcome you on board. I, I think the work that you do uh, is fantastic. It's phenomenal, and it's it's truly needed. And right. uh, I'm very excited that you're getting this award because um, you're one of those celebrities that puts your uh, money where your mouth is, as a, if I could say it that way. <laughs> yeah. uh, you do get involved, um, and I would have to say uh, you're still punk rock with this work. Uh, yeah. Definitely, I'll never, <laughs> not, I'll never not be punk rock. That's for sure. I, I may look it. a certain way. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's much needed. People ask, well, you know, they ask, well, why don't you do that in America? Well, America has a lot of sources, you know, and, and, and animal services and really India it's needed. And so it, it, it's in Thailand. So Calcutta is a whole other thing where there's like one or two or animal organizations. And, you know, I've gone there and visited them and you know, I think that we, that, that, uh, I have to say, I think APA is just at the top. Can you give us one really great experience that, uh, stood out for you with your work with the APA? You know, it can be, it can be a sad thing. It could be something that was incredible, but it made you go, whoa, we really are helping. Well, I mean, I visit, I'm not going to name the place, but I, uh, I visited a, um, a animal hospital, or I don't know what it, what, what we would call it, but it, it or animal center where they supposedly treat. And I, you know, I walked out. It was hot and humid, and yeah. I walked out, and there were like workers, the, the the employees, like sitting on the fence smoking cigarettes while a dog was dying, you know, in the hot sun. And I was, you know, and I mean, you have to go with the culture there. You have to like respect the culture yeah. where they don't do euthanasia and stuff, but. <clears throat> It just made me like there was no, there's a, like a lack of compassion. It was just a job. And I thought if we do this, I want to find people who absolutely love animals and that dog should not be dying in the hot sun, you know, at yeah. least put it in the shade. If you can't euthanize it, at least put it in the shade, you know, and keep it cool and, and comfort it. And um, so I think that the, the team, um, you know, um, and, and the other thing is that, the, you know, when you, we spend a lot of time in India and people, you don't even have to spend a lot of time to know that a lot of people live from day to day. And um, yeah. so, you know, there were a few team members that couldn't eat. They, they weren't coming. They were, they were coming to work and not being able to uh, perform, you know, and, and they were weak and we found out that they couldn't afford to eat. So now we have before every day, we have a big group breakfast where, you know, they could at least get one, full nutritious meal you know 
So yeah. it's, I mean, I love India because it's like life. It's like right in your face. You know, it's just every day is, is uh, it's real life. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm just really proud of it. And, and, and the other thing is, is that I'm not being the white savior. They're doing it themselves. Yeah. They're, they're running it themselves. I just do the fundraising, you know, I'm, I provide the support, but they do all the work themselves. I love that. Yeah. Cause that can be a problem, you know, being the white savior, I'm going to show up, I'm going to help you people. And it's like, no, 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 no. my way, you have to do it yeah. my way. Uh, yeah. In Star Trek, they talk about the prime directive. Don't interfere. <laughs> Let them do their thing. And I believe yes, in that. Exactly. Um, how did you meet the founder of Yoga Gives Back, Kayoko Mitsumatsu? How did how did that come Gosh. about? Because she can't say enough about you, I swear. Oh, uh, so sweet. <laughs> well, I mean, I've done, I mean, I can't remember exactly when I met Kayoko. Probably, I mean, I became we we became friendly when Donna Delore who is a, an amazing uh, curtain singer, dev devotional singer. And I did a um, uh, a song together. It's a mantra um, that we did um, for, to benefit in Yoga Gives Back. So, I mean, she's really, I mean, she talk about walking your talk. I mean, yeah. she's so devoted to her organization. So, and I have great respect for her. Um, and and what they do so hopefully one day that since their her organization is is based in bengal hopefully one day we we can do something together and i i'm sure we will when the time is right yeah i, I heard about this this uh song that you sang this mantra uh and by the way you have a fantastic singing voice and that's not <laughs> me just you know being an amateur here my mom was a professional singer uh, and played piano back in the sixties and seventies. And, uh, I played drums with her. I accompanied her. I started at nine years old. So, um, you know, you, you really have a great voice. Are you, are you still touring? Am, am I correct? Oh yeah. I had, I mean, I, I, you know, I have a tour in a couple of weeks in Australia. Um, <laughs> nice. I sort of slowed down a little bit, yeah. uh, cause I've been working really hard since I was 17 doing this. So, and I just turned 66. So um, I'm working in a different way, but I work all the time. I'm doing some go-go shows next year. Nice. Um, so yeah. So yeah, I was do as I'm, I'm lucky. I can, I have an amazing body of work. I can work as little or as much. So I just, it's all about fun for me at this point. I would agree on that one. We reach a point where that's it. That's uh, it. A couple of my fans of the show reached out to me and they had some uh, questions for you. And this is going out to Susie Stahl. I went to high school with her, Susie Snyder. Uh, she wanted to know, she watched your documentary, read your book and everything. Um, you opened up quite a bit about your addiction in your memoir, Lips Unsealed. Right. Um, if you could go back and talk to your teenage self, what would you tell yourself? Well, besides don't do drugs, I would say... <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I would say you're perfect as you are. You're perfect. Um, because, and I never, I never, I always felt less than, I think that was probably the root of everything, you know, and the way I grew up. So yeah, I would say you're perfect the way you are. Wow. And you are, I mean, you know, uh, we're outsiders, so everybody we don't know what's is. going on. No, but, no, but everybody is. I mean, wherever that's they're true. at, that's where they should be. So I agree. That's what namaste means. I acknowledge yeah. the, the, God in you, the divine in you, and you recognize it in me. So exactly, you exactly. hit it. Thank you. Uh, my last question, as we come up on the twenty minutes, is um, I ask this of every one of my guests, and that is, out of everything you've done, everything you are doing, and maybe even future things, what are you the most proud of, or what is your your favorite memory from the things you're most proud of? Um, gosh. You know, besides being a wife and my my family, I would say probably when I um, became sober. You know, when, and 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 I I had I from age seventeen to forty seven, I was really struggling. Even though I was putting on this this this, um, I had a perfect facade. I cleaned up well, um, but I think that that is probably that that I'm really really proud of that. And I know it's by the grace of God that 
um, yeah, that I found it because a lot of people don't, you yeah. know, don't know, never find it or they can't stay. It's, it's, it's a, it's a tough thing. So yeah. that that's probably it for me. God bless you on that one. Because, um, those of you who are listening right now, I want you to understand Belinda went through a lot and back, watch some documentaries about her, read her books. Um, I want you to know she went into a hotel for three days on a cocaine bender and correct me if I'm wrong on this, this is what yeah. I got from it, but you had a vision of yourself dead in the bed and that yeah. turned you around. Uh, yeah. I know. I heard, I had a auditory hallucination and it said it was a, it was a voice and I know it was real. I mean, and it said, you're going to die if you continue. I said, okay, I'll stop it. Please let me finish what I have. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. I just, I just finished what I had. <laughs> Please God, just let me finish my, you know, finish what I have. I bought, you know, so I finished it. And then that was like, I quit. I, I just like, you know, I had to surrender that I was really like powerless. And um, I was living in France at the time. I found an amazing sponsor who walked me through everything. And that was the first time I actually listened to somebody else and, you know, didn't think that I knew better than everybody else. And I knew it all. Um, and that was like the beginning of a really, the most, the most interesting part of my life. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, Belinda Carlisle, thank you for being on Awakened oh, Nation you. today. Thank you. Thank you so much. You bet. And uh, hey, everybody, tune in next week, and we're going to have another extraordinary guest here on Awakened Nation. Bye-bye for now. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. You bet. Bye. Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe and share this episode out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success is because of you. Thank you and see you next week.